Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of Space Court Foundation's interview series for women of color in space. I'm Nivedita Raju, Director of Legal Affairs and Research at Space Court. At the Foundation, we firmly believe in the benefit of outer space for all of humankind. Each episode of our series features a different speaker and highlights their experiences in the international space sector as a woman of color. This week, we're thrilled to feature Deepika Jayakodi from India. Deepika is the Commercial Contracts and Bid Manager at Airbus Defence and Space in the Netherlands. Welcome, Deepika. As someone who has experience in many different types of legal work, please tell our viewers how you ended up specialising in space law. Um, my entry to this field was completely by accident. I was about 13 when I read about uh, air and space law in a book, and that was the first moment that I decided I should pursue law as a profession. But when I went to college, I completely forgot about that, and I was interested in a few other subjects, uh, technology laws, public international law, and IP laws. And it was several years after that when someone I met uh, during a case mentioned that I should think about pursuing space law at Leiden. At this point, I had no clue where this place was or what the course was about, but that suggestion sort of changed my career path. And at Leiden, I was most inspired by the many lectures and visits that we had. And, and the lecturers were not just uh, lawyers, they were scientists and entrepreneurs. And I think that exposure made me think about space law more seriously. And the more I learn about the industry, I get curious about uh, how we will apply uh, laws uh, and regulations to the future of technology or the different space activities that we carry out. I would say specializing in space law is, is more of a continuing exercise. Uh, prior to working at Airbus, you founded this NGO and it focuses on the rehabilitation of trans people in Tamil Nadu, India. Could you please tell us more about this organization's work? It was in 2011 when a bunch of friends who were lawyers, social workers, some of them even HR professionals, we came together to contribute in whatever small way we can to our community. And since then, we've been working on raising awareness on social issues and human rights through different media. One is puppetry, and we have several other things, uh, legal and medical aid camps, summer camps, competitions, and so on. And apart from that, we work on two full-time projects for the benefit of rural children and uh, transgender people. The trans community in India is one of the most ostracized uh, communities. So this was the reason why we wanted to support them to exercise their basic rights. So the things uh, that we do include registering them for voting, helping them get ID cards to access social benefits, provide shelter for those who run away from home, identify opportunities for continuing education and employment, and sometimes even helping them get back with their families. So to do this, we uh, launched a toll-free uh, helpline through which uh, people from the trans community could get in touch with us. The other side of this challenge is, of course, sensitizing the public about the stigma and discrimination that this community faces. In order to help that, we launched a five-minute music video that showcases the life of a trans person from when they were a child. And it shows how the little things that we can do can help change uh, their lives as well. Um, so that's a bit about the NGO. There's so much work to be done in the Indian context especially. It's amazing to see you take that initiative. And now you're commercial contracts officer and bid manager at Airbus. Could you tell us what a typical day looks like at the office? A typical day, it, it usually starts with what we call a huddle. So this is when I get to meet the people in my department to do a quick check-in, to talk about news uh, that's relevant for all of us, and also talk about the biggest uh, tasks that we will handle that day. And after that, I move on to work with my project teams. And these are the people who are actually building launcher structures and instruments, solar arrays and cool things like that. And if we are preparing for proposals or bids, there's a lot of hustle and bustle. My role is to get the team together, prepare for reviews, make sure that we have all the right inputs, help devise strategies for commercial and contractual matters, prepare for negotiations and also check for legal and regulatory compliance. And my department is also a sort of pioneer in the aerospace industry in using legal design thinking for contracts, which is basically us simplifying and visualizing contracts to make them more user-friendly. 
because a lot of the people that we work with aren't lawyers and contracts, as someone uh, said, it, it shouldn't be something that you sign and then put in a draw and forget about it. So our job is to make it a more operational tool to manage business relationships. And uh, apart from that, there's also a lot of emphasis on personal development at work. I get to experiment and exercise other skills and roles, working with innovation and business development teams, or even support with marketing and communications. So overall, it's a very fun day. And I think uh, the fact that there's a lot to show about the Dutch culture makes it super exciting too. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's very helpful to learn exactly what these professions and what your job description actually entails. That leads me to ask, is there any advice that you have, particularly for students and young professionals who are interested in a commercial space law career? I would start by saying there's more to space law than just the international treaties. Especially as a commercial space lawyer, you need to have some understanding of the technologies that are subjects of these laws and regulations. Space law is not a solitary field of law, so it helps to have a sound basis in other fields of law as well. It doesn't matter what you're calling is it. It could be uh, intellectual property laws, trade and investment law, insurance law, or even human, human rights for, uh, for that matter. And another thing that's important to know is that you don't have to be a space geek. You just have to have a growth mindset and be willing to learn from people in the other disciplines too. As lawyers, we can be too rigid sometimes. And part of our job is to support the dreams of these entrepreneurs and engineers while reminding them about the boundaries and why we have these boundaries. And sometimes if necessary, also challenge those boundaries. That's beautiful, very well articulated. And it's great advice. I'm sure your guidance will help students and young professionals who are looking for these opportunities. On the subject of work culture, it's a known fact that our sector is also severely gendered and male dominated. So what are your thoughts on work culture in the aerospace industry? I think uh, just like in other industries, there's a lot to be done to become uh, diverse and inclusive, um, not just as an industry, but, but as a society. Even so, in the past few years, there is a conscious effort to highlight what's left wanting. So you have the UN's uh, Space for Women, uh, IAF's uh, events that promote diversity and inclusion, and even this interview series. Um, th these are great examples of positive actions that are happening around us. That makes sense. Clearly, we have to be more intentional about increasing representation in our sector. How can we build a more supportive work environment? When I started at Airbus, I was this young foreigner who had no prior experience in the industry. And that was intimidating, even though I had uh, a few years of experience behind me. It was strong women mentors who helped create such a supportive environment for me. Uh, Professor Tanya from Leiden University is an example. She is a gladiator of sorts for women. She encouraged me to promote myself and the work that I do. Uh, she champions her students for opportunities that are otherwise quite hard to come by as a newcomer. And these are the things that also inspire me to do the same for those who come after me. And at Airbus, there are a lot of uh, communities to have regular exchanges in uh, cross-site communities uh, to work towards supporting uh, gender diversity. And in the Netherlands in particular, I had the support of managers and uh, colleagues, both men and women. And there were so many small things that they said and did that made a big difference. And some of them increased my awareness about unconscious bias and uh, the harmful norms that are so common uh, in our workplaces. They helped provide a safe space to have open conversations. And so this could be anything. It, it could be a regular checking with a mentor, making sure that um, any feedback that you give or any discussion you have on such topics is a two-way discussion and that somebody takes the action that's needed to support uh, someone at the right time. And there were a few others who, uh, who recognized what I'm good at even before I knew it myself. So they would provide opportunities to showcase it. And in the beginning, it could be something as simple as someone saying at a meeting, hey, I want to know what you're thinking about. This is something that we commonly do as a, as, as a woman, that we don't speak up unless we are asked. A colleague doing that can, can really help you put yourself out there to show the work that you do. 
And I think in, in general, when you have conferences and uh, events, there have been colleagues who insist that panel discussions that take place are made diverse and inclusive to showcase different perspectives, uh, opinions, and also give enough space to new people. So you don't hear the same voices and things over and over again. So I think that there are a lot of things you can do um, to make your workplace a better place. The key question you need to ask yourself is, am I being a decent person, whether it's a man or a woman or whatever gender you are? I, I really appreciate your point about uh, learning how to be assertive and engaging in dialogue. Space Court aims to increase accessibility to space law and policy, which are complicated subjects. You've studied law in three different universities, both in India and the Netherlands. What was the difficulty that you faced and what is the difficulty faced by most students of space law from an educational perspective? Accessibility is the challenge. I remember that Rubimbo also mentioned this. Study materials are often too expensive. Industry insights and expert opinions are not very easily available for students. Today, there are, of course, a lot more open, open access journals, podcasts, news items, reports, and so on, that function as good resources to begin with. And I hope it continues in that trend, that, that it becomes more accessible for students. A wealth of exchanges was opened up just in the last one year that were, until then, a space community exclusive. Um, so I think trends in that direction would really help students. And another challenge to accessibility is the manner in which we communicate uh, about space law and policy. These subjects are important for students who are also pursuing other space disciplines. And it is in our interest as lawyers that we engage and empower them to learn more about these subjects. And in, in general, if the future of humanity is in space, it's, it's only obvious that we need to start understanding the rules of play sooner rather than later. In that case, the discourse on space law and policy should become more common. Those are wonderful points, Deepika. Thank you for speaking with us today and for sharing your experience with our audience. Space Code Foundation will announce details for episode 4 soon. Until then, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and follow our page for updates.